Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to call this meeting of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources to order. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Black. Here. Assemblywoman Brown May. Here. Assemblywoman Carlton. Here. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblyman Ellison. Present. Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblywoman Titus. Here. Assemblyman Wheeler. Here. Chair Watts. Here. We have all members present. We have a quorum. Uh, before we start, I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements as we uh, always do at the start of these meetings. Uh, members of the public may provide testimony in a variety of ways. Uh, information on how to participate can be found on every meeting agenda for our committee, as well as on the help page at the legislative website. Uh, you can find a link to the help page in a header at the top of every web page there. Uh, in order to uh, provide public comment or testimony, you must sign up in advance online. Uh, you can also uh, submit opinion polls online. Written comments can be emailed to our committee email address before, during, or up to 48 hours after the meeting. Uh, committee exhibits and amendments must be submitted electronically in PDF form to our committee manager no later than 4 p.m. the business day prior to our meeting. Amendments must include the bill number, statement of intent, and contact information. All exhibits that are submitted can be found on the Nevada Legislature's website. And there you can also sign up for personalized legislative tracking. Uh, we ask that public comments and testimony be kept to two minutes so that we can accommodate all speakers and get through our agenda in a timely manner. Uh, and again, uh, for members, please remember to mute yourselves when you are not speaking uh, so that we can minimize background noise. Uh, with that, I believe we can go on to our agenda today. We have two bill hearings. Uh, I will be presenting both bills um, and we are going to go in order starting with Assembly Bill 171. And uh, with that, I will turn the uh, virtual gavel over to the vice chair to run the meeting while I present these measures. Thank you, Chair. I'll now call the meeting on Assembly Bill number 171 to order. Assembly Bill 171 establishes certain protections for certain swamp cedars. And um, Chair, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I am Assemblyman Howard Watts, uh, representing District 15 in uh, Central East Las Vegas in Clark County. It is my honor today to present Assembly Bill 171 uh, for the committee's consideration. Uh, my intent is to uh, turn this over fairly quickly to some of my co-presenters to speak about the swamp cedars and why protection for them is so important. Uh, I will walk you through uh, the, the content of this measure as well as the amendment. Um, and then we would be glad to take any questions that you have. Uh, one thing I will say, um, uh, a, a couple of things that I'll say just to start off. Uh, one is to again, uh, wanting to acknowledge that we are gathering here in the legislature uh, on the lands of the Washoe people uh, who were uh, displaced from it and who have served as its stewards for countless generations. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to say briefly on, on this particular issue is um, I've had the opportunity to uh, know uh, some of the, the co-presenters for this bill for a long time. I consider them, them close personal friends. Um, and I've had the ability to, to visit um, Basawabi and the Swamp Cedars uh, in Mr. Ellison's district. And um, that is why it was so important um, for me to bring uh, the idea to the Public Lands Committee, um, uh, which I and some others on this committee sat on during the interim. 
uh, to try and increase protection. And Assembly Bill 171 uh, specifically looks to increase the protection that is available at the state level um, for this special place. So without uh, going into too much more detail myself, I would like to turn it over to my co-presenters. And uh, joining us today, we have uh, Delane Spillsbury, we have uh, uh, Rupert Steele, and we have Monty Sanford. And um, I don't know uh, who would like to go first. Uh, if, if Delane would like to go first, um, let's, let's go ahead and start there. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Chairman Watts and members of the committee, I am Delane Stark Spillsbury, a small business owner, former Nevada Test Site employee, and a Western Shoshone woman whose family has lived in the Great Basin for time. Today, I ask you to support AB 171 and a a J R. I'm enrolled with the Elish Shoshone tribe and currently live near McGill. I am a former territory chair of the Nevada Commission on Tourism and currently in the heritage area and the Great Basin. Today, I am here on behalf of Nevada's indigenous and Miss Bills, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're you're not coming in really well, and I want to make sure that we're able to hear everything you say. Um, so let me just check with um, broadcast services if there's anything we can do to, if that's on our end or your end. Um, I'll get a little closer. Oh, this is broadcast. Okay. Um, it looks like on our end, it just says the bandwidth is low. Um, and that's probably unfortunately on Ms. Spillsbury's end. If you could have someone turn off the video, we will still be able to hear you and that way you won't cut out. And to turn off the video, you'll go to that camera. There you go. Try now. For many years, the committee we can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you. For many years, the Confederated Tribes of the Ghost Shoot Reservation, the Elish Shoshone, and the Duckwater Shoshone have been working to tell an important story about our heritage. My contribution to those efforts follow. I am here today to encourage protection of what's sacred to my family and my tribe. The Spring Valley stands of Rocky Mountain Juniper, known locally as Swamp Cedars. Spiritually and culturally, the Swamp Cedars grow within an area referred to by my people as Basawabi, which means sacred water in our new language. Basawabi was an important meeting place for the Nua. Before colonization, Indigenous peoples from across the Great Basin traveled far and wide to congregate in Spring Valley. It was a place for prayer, celebration, medicine, and rejuvenation, and that remains so today. The spiritual and cultural past of swamp cedars represent what it means to be Native and what it means to be Nua. However, the swamp cedars also damning about the history of Nevada, ethnic cleansing of my people. Spring Valley was home to at least three major massacres of Native people between 1850 and 1900. Two were military-led engagements. The third was conducted by a band of vigilantes. My grandmother was one of two children who survived the last massacre. As she hid in a ditch, she witnessed bloodthirsty thugs kill off her relatives and friends and desecrate her place of worship, her place of solace. For the remaining Nua people, it is our firmest belief that the swamp cedars in Spring Valley embody spirits and of the lives lost during those massacres. Our relatives are in those trees 
And that is why I continue to go out there. That is where I go to visit relatives. Significance of Boss Wabi to my people. We've heard Boss Wabi be compared to places like Mecca or Vatican City. Another comparison would be to a massacre, wounded knee, and countless other sites where native people were unjustly attacked. But I want to say that you cannot compare Basawabi to anywhere else. There is only one. And if the swamp cedars are gone from Basawabi, then it is all gone. Basawabi is listed on the National Register of Historic Places as a traditional cultural property. Part of the site is also listed as an area of critical environmental concern with the Bureau of Land Man Management. But while those designations sound like proper safeguards, we have learned over many years that those terms offer only no nominal protections. We are here today to ask for something with teeth. AB 171 ensures that anyone committing any activity that would extricate a swamp cedar would have to get a permit from Nevada Division of Forestry or else face a penalty under the law. Currently, there are no prop protections in Nevada law for sacred trees like the swamp cedars. We are long overdue for a change. While I respect what state officials wrote in January to the interim public ends committee, we respectfully ask that they use this opportunity, opportunity to listen learn and respect their wishes. We hope this can be an opportunity to build bridges between our tribal governments and the state of Nevada. Though the swamp cedars may not be officially considered a unique genetic population of Rocky Mountain junipers, they sure are unique to me. And if genetic tests were taken, obviously there would be differences. It's just a judgment way. Nonetheless, that misses the point. Basawabi trees bring my people feelings of both comfort and sadness. But then those trees on top of the mountain, a juniper is just a juniper. As it relates to AJR4, we know that Congress on the executive branch of the federal government can take more action to help preserve such a special place. And I'm Together, sorry these Ms. two measures. Ms. Get Nevada. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but but um, yes, um, just uh, keep this to. We want to make sure that our minutes are correct and that we respect history of the hearing. So, um, if you can just keep to AB 171 for now, and then we'll um, and then we'll okay, that, AJR that was just along. We'll let you address that. Okay. Okay, there's nothing go else ahead. on it I wanted to say. Okay, please go ahead. <laughs> Together, these two okay. Together, these two measures give Nevada the chance to do something that we thought we would be impossible just a few years ago. My son Rick often says, if Basawabi and the swamp cedars are harmed, it will be my own personal extinction. And I feel the same. It would be my my extinction event also. Basawabi represents what it means to me, what it means to be Native, and what it means to be Nua. That's why I encourage you now to protect the spirits of our Nua ancestors, our culture, and history of our Nua people. Please pass AB 171. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing your family and your people's um, story and history with us. Um, with that, Chair, um, would you like to introduce your next presenter? Yes, thank you, Vice Chair, and uh, thank, again, thank you to Ms. Billsbury uh, for for tuning in from uh, rural Nevada and and uh, and working through the connectivity issues to share your words with us. I appreciate it. Um, I believe next, and I, I think um, he's participating by phone. I'd like to have. Um, uh, Rupert Steele with the Confederated Tribes of the Go Shoot um, provide testimony. So I don't know if 
broadcast if we can figure out a way to get uh, Mr. Steele to uh, connect by phone. Sure, this is broadcast. We are working on it. Thank you. Mr. Steele, uh, okay. if you can hear me. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Oh, this is Rupert. Can you hear me? Yes, yes please go ahead. You. Okay. Uh, no, Rupert, still, when you're living here, the second came from Evan Bowen. No, go shoot. The Russia Johnny. No, I can move the skin. Came from the music people in the same way. Good afternoon, committee. I thank you for giving this opportunity for me to uh, testify on behalf of my relatives and all those who gave up their life for me to survive. <clears throat> my name is Rupert Steele. I'm the chairman of the Confederate Tribes of the Go Shoot. I'm half Shoshone and I'm half Go Shoot. And Pasawabi is a very important, sacred, and spiritual, and holy place for us, just as you would as you enter the place of worship. My people were massacred in a very, very harsh way at Swamp Cedar. In just like a seed, each one of those swamp cedars was fertilized by one of those that was massacred there, one of my people fertilize that tree. And through that, we live spiritually and connect with Mother Earth through them. And to destroy those trees would be an act of genocide. And this is very important for me to come before you today in support of AB 171 to protect it. Yes, there are protections out there now, but Spirit tells us it is not enough. It's, it's not sufficient to protect the natural environment, including the swamp cedar trees. That place, Spring Valley, has a historical, very important significance to all Indian people. Place of gathering, place of mourning, place of telling stories, place to be together and pray for each other. Pray for those that are gone before us. And pray for us here that are now here at at this walk on the earth and pray for our young ones who are still coming our way. I go there to say those good things when I'm there with my ancestors, knowing the spirits are there with me. It gives me a good feeling to know, and I thank them for what they have done. They give up their life, ultimate sacrifice for me to live here and for my children, my grandchildren, to be here, enjoy life as they would if they were here. Makes me proud to be among them when I go there. And I want to say that we are all human. We were all brought here. We had no choice in who we were. But we do have a choice on how we treat people, treat each other. I want to say 
Again, please support AB 171. And thank you, committee. That's the end of my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Steele, and, and thank you for also sharing about um, your family and your people with us. Um, Chair, uh, would you like to introduce your next speaker? Yes, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And I'd also just like to advise uh, members of the committee as well as members of the public that uh, both uh, Ms. Spillsbury and Mr. Steele submitted written comments for the record as well. Um, with that, if Mr. Uh, Sanford would like to uh, say some words uh, in, on this bill. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Watts and members of the committee. I'm gonna read my, uh, read my comments. I can't, uh, I can't ad lib so well, like uh, Chairman, Chairman Steele uh, was able to. And then also like to say thank you to Rupert Steele and Delane uh, for having the courage and taking the time to testify today as well. Uh, Chairman Watts and members of the committee, my name is Monty Sanford. I have worked with the Confederated Tribes for almost a decade and a half. I want to extend our thanks for creating this opportunity to be heard regarding AB 171. Swamp Cedars is the only place in the United States that we know of where Indigenous people were specifically targeted and massacred at times of religious gatherings at the same place, time after time after time. Delane and Rupert, have, as Delane and Rupert have said, the swamp cedar trees are the living embodiment of the relatives who were massacred. And it cannot be emphasized enough how important and sacred this connection is to Goshoot and Western Shoshone people and some Paiute people. They have suffered some of the worst atrocities of human rights and human rights violations in recorded history. <clears throat> Massacres at Vasawabi were part of Native American of the Native American genocide that went on for centuries. Goshoot and Western Shoshone people have little left, but what remains, including the sacred grove of swamp cedar trees, is vital for the survival of their religion and their culture. Currently, the swamp cedar trees have little to no legal protection at the state or federal levels. Parts of Basawabi, as, uh, as Delane has mentioned, they do have certain federal land management designations, the ACEC, and the traditional cultural property. Unfortunately, neither one of those actually provide any real legal protection for the swamp cedar trees. The ACEC and the TCP could potentially result in management changes to management plans and management decisions, but it does not protect the trees from being destroyed. Whereas AB 171 uh, the proposed changes to NRS 527 would make it unlawful to destroy the trees. That said, we are simply asking this, that the swamp cedar trees be protected as provided in this bill. There is no other place in Nevada or in the nation like swamp cedars. This is a special circumstance that deserves special protection. This bill would not make the swamp cedar trees an endangered species, rather, it would simply afford the trees similar protections. We have heard opponents say that protections for swamp cedar trees are a matter better suited for the federal government. We do not dispute that the federal government could do much more to protect this sacred area. However, there is no provision in existing federal law to protect these trees as intended under AB 171. To get a new federal law passed through Congress is an enormous mountain to climb but that is separate and apart from AB 171. Moreover, the Nevada legislature has already codified protections for all kinds of other plants, including Christmas trees, cacti, yucca, <clears throat> cacti, yuccas, uh, which are all widespread across the Western United States. Since the legislature has chosen to protect and regulate these common plants, then clearly the protection of the only grove of swamp cedar trees anywhere in the world is a matter appropriate for the legislature to support. We have heard opponents argue that swamp cedar trees should not be protected for fear of um, that they may not be a distinct population. As it relates to AB 171, this is an arbitrary rule and it does not apply. This bill does not legislative, legislatively make swamp cedar trees a distinct population or an endangered species. 
um, Christmas trees, yucca, cacti have special protections, but those are all those are also not listed as endangered or occurring in distinct populations. We have also heard fears that protecting swamp cedars could set a could set a precedent. If the legislature could not act for fear of setting a precedent, then the entire legislative branch of government would likely deteriorate. And we feel that this is appropriate to honor and protect indigenous history and culture in Nevada. So if AB 171 sets that precedent, then it is time to do so. That said, AB 171 offers a clear path to providing protections for swamp cedar trees. The bill would not only protect an exceptional and unique stand of trees within the state, but it would also protect the last fragments of where we mourn the families lost during the genocide, the connection we have with our ancestors and our indigenous place for ceremony. Swamp Cedars is like a temple and an Arlington cemetery all in one. It adds significant depth of history, culture, religion, and diversity to the great state of Nevada. Surely the sacred grove of swamp cedar trees is worthy of protection as proposed in AB 171. For these reasons, the tribes respectfully ask that you vote yes to support AB 171 and thank you for your time and we appreciate your support. Thank you, Mr. Sanford. Um, Chair, uh, will there be anyone else speaking in, as part of the presentation? Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, some of them watch for the record. No, that, that, that concludes the presentation. If it's all right, I'd like to briefly step everyone through the bill itself and then would be glad to stand for any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so going briefly through Assembly Bill 171, uh, section one adds a, a new section to chapter 527 of the Nevada Revised Statutes, which uh, provides for the protection of certain flora in, in, in our state. It, it essentially declares um, the policy of the state to protect the Spring Valley population of Rocky Mountain junipers, known as swamp cedar. And uh, it specifically confines this to uh, those trees that occur in White Pine County within the Basawabi traditional cultural property. Um, that's important. As was heard earlier, there was a discussion in the Public Lands Committee. Juniper trees are found uh, all across the state and across the region. Um, however, there is nowhere else where you can find them in a, in a valley floor. Um, and uh, it's quite unique based primarily on the fact that the water table uh, is essentially at ground level, uh, providing the resources that that these trees need to uh, survive and thrive. And so uh, for those who have traveled the state, you when you get to this valley, you see how different and significant it is to have uh, a stand of, of uh, Rocky Mountain junipers uh, thriving in this, in this valley floor. So we use the geographic area to define these trees, to separate them from the junipers that occur in the mountain ranges all across the state. Um, it, it then makes it unlawful for, for any person to negligently or willfully cut, destroy, mutilate, or remove um, any of these trees without first obtaining a special permit from the, from the state forest or fire, fire warden and complying with any other applicable requirements. And, uh, and then it permits the Division of Forestry to develop uh, any needed regulations to carry this out. This is similar to the protection that's found for what are called fully protected species, which is essentially how our state uh, defines and protects uh, endangered plants. There was a discussion about this in the Public Lands Committee. And again, um, that is a scientific designation made for distinct populations. Um, this is essentially laying out, because of the incredible cultural um, uh, importance of this area, and the importance of the trees to this area um, that we're going to require a permit. I, I know that there'll probably be some questions about to what extent the state government and federal government have the ability to do these things. This is just applying a standard that we already have. Um, it is not a ban on the removal, but it requires that if anyone wants to purposefully uh, take any of these trees down, that they must go through an additional permitting process with the Division of Forestry 
before they would be able to do so. So uh, it's just putting some uh, additional constraints and uh, uh, a little bit higher barrier to demonstrate that the importance of that would outweigh the cultural importance that uh, these that these unique trees have to our state. Uh, section two really just makes conforming changes um, uh, in most of the sections. And then I want to speak briefly to the amendment uh, that I have proposed. to Section two, subsection one, paragraph C four. Uh, and essentially what you'll see in the current language of the statute is it mentions that some of these um, uh, provisions do not apply to, as it says, Indians native to Nevada uh, who gather any such article or food for med uh, or med medicinal use for themselves or for any other person being treated by Indian religious ceremony. And so uh, with the Confederated Tribes of the Goshu found their lands uh, span multiple state uh, borders. Um, as do some other uh, native tribes. So what we're offering here is a, it's essentially some cleanup language in this amendment so that it would instead read, the provisions of this section do not apply to Indians who gather any such article for food, medicinal or ceremonial use. So just streamlining the language about the uses and again, making sure that if a member of the Confederated Tribes of the Goshu uh, happens to reside within uh, the current state of Utah, for example, uh, they are not considered uh, non-native uh, to come to Basawabi and and practice um, their their ceremonies and uh, and traditional uh, activities. So that is the bill, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that members of the committee may have. Thank you, Chair, um, and. For the record, I think um, there may have been a typo in that the amendment affects subsection four of section two. Um, so I'm receiving a, a message from our council, Mr. Ampern, to that effect. So just in case there's any confusion. Um, then additionally, um, Mr. Amber, who who isn't on the call, which is why I'm saying this, um, is did mention uh, and he did put this in. Um, he communicated with the members, but I just want to make sure we've got this on the record that um, that it was mentioned that the current punitive scheme would apply to a per, um, apply if a person cut, destroyed, mutilated, picked, or removed a swamp cedar pursuant to AB 171, and um, the penalty is found in subsection three of NRS. 527.050, uh, the penalty is that a person who cuts, destroys, mutilates, picks or removes a swamp cedar is guilty of a public offense proportionate to the value of the tree and in no less of a misdemeanor. Um, so he's saying that what this means is that if the damage is valued at $5,000 or more, the person is guilty of a category C felony. If the damage is valued at 250, um, to 5,000, the person is guilty of a gross misdemeanor. And if the damage is valued at less than 250, then the person is guilty of a misdemeanor. Um, and then uh, our council made reference to NRS 193.150, which provides the punishments for misdemeanors and NRS 193.155, which provides the punishment of public offense proportionate to the value of property affected. So thank you for that, um, Mr. Amburn. Um, and and with that that I'll that does bring bring to mind um, a question, um, Chair. Um, uh, especially now with because of because of the pandemic, a lot more people are taking advantage of um, getting out in nature and enjoying um, recreation in Nevada. It, is there something that's going to let them know, hey, these this is special? These are, you know, be careful here. Can, 
Thank you for the question, Vice Chair. Uh, Assemblyman Howard Watts for the record. And my connection uh, got a little fuzzy uh, as you were asking the question, but I believe I, I caught the, the tail end of it, um, basically asking uh, how people may be notified about the, the, require, the, the additional protections provided to these trees. Um, I would leave that to um, the Division of Forestry, and I don't know if they are on or we could potentially get some follow-up information about how they've notified folks about the protections that exist for other protected flora. Um, I assume it would follow a, a, a similar um, uh, a similar process. But, uh, you know, again, usually there are already um, things in place for people that wish to, to gather. And I know that there are some uh, already some restrictions on access to uh, the swamp cedars at different points. So I think there would be a several opportunities where science could be posted um, uh, and, and education could happen to make sure. Uh, but again, this is also uh, not an area that is frequented by campers and other recreationalists. It's really frequented by the native peoples. Of and what this is really focusing on is um, you know, particularly if there were some uh, future activity that had a, a major impact on, uh, you know, that would require um, a major reduction in the, the population of these trees, that there would have to be some additional um, oversight from the state before that could uh, move forward. And uh, one, one other thing I'll note very briefly is you're right, I do have a, an additional letter in my uh, amendment. I got a little lost in the, the subsections and paragraphs. So uh, my apologies for that. I think we all understand that. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, with that, I have a question from uh, Assemblywoman Titus. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for, for your bill. I have a couple of questions, okay. Um, and thank you for the presenters. Early on in the presentation of the of the bill, it was it was a statement made about the type of junipers. Obviously, I live in a rural area. We have a ton of juniper trees, high mountains. And I'm wondering about the genetic testing on these trees. Um, I understand there's no unique genetic testing on these trees. These are uh, like the other juniper trees that are throughout the state of Nevada. Is that correct? Thank you for the question, uh, Howard Watts, for the record. Uh, I don't believe any genetic testing has been done on these trees. And uh, while I would love to have the resources to do some scientific testing to find out, I think that would be very interesting. Um, we simply do not know. And um, this was something that came up uh, during the Public Lands Committee discussion as well. And I, the one thing I'd say is it's important. What's important uh, is the cultural importance to the tribes of these trees and, and to their beliefs. And so regardless of the um, genetic makeup, that's specifically why we didn't look to protect these trees under the existing statute for uh, fully protected species and instead created a new section of statute uh, to afford them these protections. So um, yeah, we know no, either way. All right, thank you. A follow-up, Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chair. Um, do we know the number of acres and how, how much of this is on private land versus BLM land? I'm not, I haven't seen a map. I apologize where this is, but I just need some clarification. Is this on private land? Thank you for that question. Howard Watts, the record. The Basawabi traditional cultural property overlays with uh, BLM managed lands. And uh, then within that, there is a smaller uh, area of critical environmental concerns. So this is on public lands. And I'm sorry, whether it's because I had my, um, I didn't have my mute button on, I lost that. So I understand I had not as that this, none of this is on private land. Chair, you're kind of frozen up. I don't know if you can hear us. Uh, 
Uh, I, I just got back. So if you could uh, repeat that, I'll, uh, I'll be sure to respond. Thank you. I, I apologize and I'll shut my mute button right away. So hopefully we're not. Um, I'm just wondering if I wasn't clear. None of this is on private land. Thank you, Assemblyman Watts, for the record. Um, I can have, I believe uh, Mr. Sanford may know the acreage. I believe that was part of the question you asked, but this is federal land overlay, the traditional cultural property. One last question, if I might, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I'm concerned about, we have negotiated some um, situations uh, with uh, the feds and other folks about putting sage hen, prairie chickens, or however you want to call them, on, not on the endangered list. And part of that negotiation was clearing um, sagebrush juniper interface and encroachment of pinions and juniper on perhaps some sage hen land. Um, and I'm wondering, I would just want some clarity that none of this, this area would interfere with negotiations that we have already made for the habitat for uh, Satan. Thank you for the question. Assemblyman Watts for the record. Uh, no, it would not interfere. These uh, lands have had uh, these trees upon them for quite some time. So this was never uh, sage grouse habitat that has been encroached upon. So it's separate. I mean, and, and there's, uh, I think, a discussion about many areas very close by that have seen some encroachment um, down the down the hillsides. This is this is not one of those areas, so I don't believe that it uh, would be factored into those decisions about uh, sage grouse habitat. Thank, uh, thank you for those answers, and thank you, Madam Vice Chair, for the questions. You're welcome. I have a question from Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Vice Chair. Cohen and thank you, uh, Chair Watts, as well as Elders uh, Spillsbury and Steele, for sharing your your stories with us and the insignificance of this of this information. Uh, my question has to do with Section 1.3 with the regulations. It's a very small question with the possibility of the word may. Uh, with that adoption of regulations, which I realize is not part of this body, it's a decision made at the department level. Will there be individuals from the, um, from uh, in particular from either Elder Spillsberries or Elder Steele's tribes, will there, there be an expectation that there's also participation from their tribes or is that just something that the um, department can make the decision on their own without conferring with others? Thank you for the question. Uh, Howard Watts for the record. Uh, indeed, that is ultimately left up to the discretion of the Division of Forestry. Uh, since they already have uh, permitting programs in place for other types of protected flora, they may uh, borrow considerably from that. And so they may uh, simply need to make small modifications to be inclusive as opposed to the development of a specific program. Um, it would be my interest to see um, them engage with uh, members of the the tribes, the the Duckwater, uh, the Confederated Tribes of the Goshen, uh, the Ely Shoshone, uh, if they were to develop uh, regulations specific to carry out this program. But that ultimately would be uh, left up to the division. Thank you for that clarification, and I just wanted to get that on record. So, thank you very much again for bringing this forward. Thank you and I. I have a question. So, so with the with the state forester fire warden, um, I, I understand they're going to be adopting regulations. But um, so so when I first read that paragraph, I was thinking it was more like there would be a um, a a permit would be granted to um, promote the health of the trees. And so it sounds like that's not necessarily the case and there might be other reasons that um, a permit would be granted. Thank you for the question, Vice Chair. Howard Watts for the record. So essentially, um, this gets back to something I touched on a little bit earlier, and this is just the difficulty in uh, shared stewardship over natural resources between the state and federal governments. 
Um, so we we see this with water, with wildlife, and in this case with flora. Um, since these lands are federally managed, um, we do not have the ability to 100% uh, dictate uh, the land management decisions within that area. Um, but we can apply permitting and other things uh, to try and align uh, the federal management activities with our state public policy objectives. And so this is an example of that. Um, we have that for our fully protected species, which again is essentially our state endangered species list for plants. Um, and we cannot uh, essentially say something that, that completely forbids the, take, uh, the, the harvesting of those plants on federal lands, but we can develop a permitting system uh, to try and uh, manage and adjust any of those proposals so that it, they are more in line with our our scientific or in the case of this bill public policy objectives so we're using that same permitting process uh, the permit would be uh, if anyone intends to uh, essentially destroy the tree uh, uh, any of the trees and again i'll just make clear specifically within this geographic boundary of the Fasawabi traditional cultural property. Thank you for that. that. That does make it a little more clear for me. All right, with that, I have a question from Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Vice Chair, for the opportunity and thank you, Chairman Watts, for bringing this bill. Um, you kind of touched a little bit on what I was gonna ask. So let me start here. Um, when we talk about Spring Valley population uh, within the Osawabi traditional cultural property. Do, can you remind me, we might've talked about this in public lands. How much acreage are we talking about? Thank you for that question. Uh, Howard Watts, the record. I'd actually like to see if uh, Mr. Stanford has uh, that figure available. I do not have it at my fingertips right now. Chairman Watts. Um, that is 14,100 and something acres. So a little, just barely over 14,000 acres, which is a pretty small fraction of, of Spring Valley. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just a follow up chair to that to expand a little bit or vice chair, if I could. Uh, yes, but first, just for the record, just so we've, um, for the sake of our secretaries uh, to make their lives a little easier, just for the record, that was Mr. Sanford. Um, please go ahead, Assemblywoman. Thank you. So, um, and Chairman Watts, I think you might have gone there a little bit when we, when you were answering Assemblywoman Cohen's uh, questions. The permitting navigates the BLM issues. Uh, we had discussed um, at the the public lands meeting, I think in September of 2020, that it was it was discussed. I think it was Ms. Charleston discussed whether lands managed by the BLM um, can be protected under Chapter 527 of the NRS. Um, I think that's why on the motion, even though many of us support this whole idea, some of us were a little concerned about how do we navigate this. So is this how we're addressing it in this bill is to, to take advantage of the permitting concept? Thank you so much for the question. Assemblyman Howard Watts for the record. Yes, so uh, as you know, uh, I, I think particularly uh, some of these members are, are very well aware of some of the difficulties and conflicts that happen in management of federal lands and the, the limitations on the role that the state can play um, at some points. And yet, as I've mentioned before, um, on there are certain, while the lands may be managed um, by the federal government and, and they can make uh, more of the direct decisions about the, the land use, uh, the state um, manages things like the wildlife, the plant life and the water and the public trust. And so we do have uh, while not an absolute say, some influence. And so, um, again, when you look at the uh, list of fully protected species, there's a permitting system in place. So we, again, we can't tell the federal government, you absolutely cannot uh, do anything that will harm any of these species, but we can have them engage in, in a, 
process, a conversation, a dialogue with our state uh, division of forestry, figure out how those uh, concerns may be mitigated, maybe put some uh, additional requirements or considerations into place before anything was allowed to move forward. So that is, uh, you know, basically the extent that the state can play in providing some protections. And uh, that's, so we, we applied that, um, that structure, that permitting structure, but then again, we took it away from trying to make a scientific designation or determination about it being uh, uh, genetically distinct, but then tried to address the concerns about this providing broad protections for all Rocky Mountain junipers by creating a specific geographic boundary um, that already exists within that traditional cultural property. Thank you, that helps, appreciate it. And with that, I have a question from Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you, Madam. And I've got a lot of my questions answered. I spent a lot of my time in, in these areas up in there and on horseback and and I still keep going back to the mine. Is 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 these just strictly a juniper tree but with another name? That's that's one question. And then the other question is uh what about uh pruning? and and uh, getting rid of undergrowth uh, to keep from fires going in there. Could somebody answer these questions? Thank you, Mr. Ellison. Uh, Howard Watts for the record. Uh, again, uh, based on the language of the statute, there'd have to be a, a permitting conversation. I think the distinctions between uh, cutting down and killing a tree versus uh, pruning or doing um, uh, work in the, the underlying vegetation are, are very different topics. So, um, and, you know, and again, it depends on if you're talking about undergrowth, we're not actually managing the land, we're trying to protect the trees. So um, activities that would promote the, the health of the ecosystem by managing the underbrush, if they're not uh, damaging the trees are is kind of a separate item. Uh, as far as pruning, again, it would just be a conversation with the state forester uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, it's not causing significant damage or harm to the to the site and its cultural value. As to your first question, um, again, I, I think we haven't done the research to see if they're genetically different. Um, they're culturally significant and completely unique in that they exist on this valley floor. So. I think uh, in that regard, uh, they they certainly are unique as swamp cedars. Whether they're a, a genetically distinct type of juniper from those that are found in other parts of the state is up in the air, but it's, it's my opinion that uh, we should make sure we protect the trees in this area regardless of, of where they fall genetically. A follow up, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Watts, it, one of the questions I have is because up in Eureka County and, and areas in White Pine County, uh, the BLM is, is moving a lot of trees. And the reason they're doing that is because of the water table is dropping. And they're trying to, to save most of the trees by, by getting rid of some of them. And the reason they were saying that what called the underbrush or even in the areas is because of lightning strikes. And when they hit that, they lose hundreds and hundreds of acres out in there by by wellland fires and that's why they're trying to remove some of the trees and some of the brush that's out in there uh, is to protect these and also to protect the sage grouse. so uh, i'm hoping we get some of these answered that we can because uh, like i said i i spent a lot of most of my life on a saddle in a lot of these areas and and i've never heard of the names of some of these that that, that are called so I don't know if it's a tribal thing or if it's it, a, the tree that's got some other berries on it that I'm not aware of. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you for that, um, Assemblyman Ellison. Howard Watts, for the record. Uh, it, this certainly is an issue that's particularly uh, important to the, the tribal communities um, where who call this their ancestral home and, and current place where they practice um, uh, their traditions. Uh, you know, again, the process this, this, this establishes is a conversation and, and permitting with our state division of forestry. 
And as you know, our forester is also our fire warden. So um, I'm confident that any any decisions that have an impact on um, our wildland fire uh, management and mitigation would definitely be taken into consideration if somebody had a, a plan to uh, cut or prune or in, uh, in any way uh, address these these trees. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, not seeing any. I think we will uh, go to uh, support. Um, and, and just a reminder, we'll be keeping uh, support. We've got several people who want to testify. So in order to make sure everyone can testify, um, we're going to keep testimony to two minutes. Um, certainly, if you have more to say, you're welcome to send in your statements and uh, that will go onto the record and the committee will review that as well. Um, with that, uh, BPS, if, um, and I don't think there's anyone else on the Zoom in support. So yeah, with that, uh, BPS, if you can go to the phones, please. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 171, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 728, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. For the record, this is Marla McDade-Williams. M-A-R-L-A-M-C, capital D-A-D-E-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, with Strategies 360 and speaking today on behalf of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. I want to extend our respect to Ms. Silfberry and Mr. Steele for their comments and for carrying the Native history to this body. We also want to thank Assemblyman Watts and the members of the Legislative Committee on Public Lands for this bill. The Reno Sparks Indian Colony has members who are Paiute, Shoshone, and Washoe, and their ancestors have been affected by issues like this throughout the history of this country. That said, historical cultural areas of Nevada are important to all of us, and we urge your support for AB 171. Thank you. Thank you. And if we can have the next person on the phone. Caller with the last three digits 155, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy Cabrera, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-C-A-B-R-E-R-A. -E I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director for the Nevada Conservation League here in support of AB 171. As has been mentioned during the bill presentation, swamp cedars are sacred to indigenous communities and are critical to their spiritual and cultural practices. Swamp cedars are also threatened by climate change, drought, and overpumping of groundwater. These trees have cultural, historical, and ecological significance and are deserving of protection under the law. We urge the committee's support. Thank you. Thank you. And if we can have the next person in support, please. Caller with the last three digits, 594. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Uh, hello, my name is Shania Marks, S-H-A-N-I-A-M-A-R-Q-U-E-S, and I am a cultural representative for the Ely Shoshone tribe. I believe that this bill offers protection to the swamp cedars that they do not currently have and need. Basawabi is one of the few places left that we can connect to our past and honor those who sacrificed all for us to be here today. And for those reasons, I support AB 171. Thank you. And if we can have the next person in support. Caller with the last three digits, 557. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. I am Rick Spilsbury, R-I-C-K-S-P-I-L-S-B-U-R-Y, and I'm a tribal elder of the Ely Shoshone tribe, 
and I'm here to ask you to pass AB 171. You can help save a small forest in an age of deforestation. You can help save a historically important memory in an age of distraction. You can help save a culture in an age of cancel culture. This is just the right thing to do. Moreover, you can help our Native people gain faith in the system by showing some worthy respect for the natural things that are so important to us. My Native ancestors were forcefully taught that Indian ways were primitive and not important. But we do have an important message. This is not, in every way, the peak of human civilization. Our Native Great Basin ancestors proved that humans can happily live here sustainably for thousands of years. And that is what many people don't want to think about. Of course, we can't go back, but neither would should we ignore the wisdom of the ages. All we are asking is please don't look the other way and allow someone to kill the trees too. In a, by not allowing the literal wiping out of the last of what is left of our people in Spring Valley, we might help people think responsibly. Because, isn't, because this isn't just about saving one of Nevada's last stands of valley forest from a localized extinction event. It's about helping to save the culture of a peaceful people and our sustainable way of thinking. Ultimately, this is about helping to save Nevada's long-term future. Thank you. Thank you. And if we can have the next person in support. Caller with the last three digits, 662. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. My name is Kyle Rorink, K-Y-L-E-R-O-E-R-I-N-K. -E uh, I'm the executive director of the Great Basin Water Network and Chairman Watts, Vice Chair Cohen, and members of the committee. The Great Basin Water Network supports AB 171 and the Chairman's Amendment. Nothing in state law currently protects the swamp cedars in Basawabi, and we hope that we can change that. AB 171 does not make the swamp cedars a fully protected species under NRS 527-270. All this bill does is give the cedars the safeguards fully protected species are afforded under NRS 527-050. We are not asking to legislatively make this a genetically distinct species. We are just asking to give it protections of those fully protected species. We do not want to give all Rocky Mountain junipers these protections. We just want to protect a small stand in Spring Valley. We are not trying to undermine precedent. We are merely trying to demand a new precedent for an indigenous sacred site like the Swamp Cedars. The status quo is not good enough for indigenous communities. AB 171 recognizes a special circumstance with existential considerations. When NGOs, elected officials, and government institutions talk about environmental justice or historical discrimination, the Swamp Cedars are a textbook example. Tonight's hearing and its accompanying legislation offers an opportunity to gain understanding about an idea that may not exist in the frame of reference of non-Native people. That is the power of the legislative branch. You have an opportunity to help build trust acknowledge the past and grow understanding among the public with this bill. That is a major milestone. I want to take this opportunity to again thank the indigenous leaders and elders for sharing their stories. They are powerful and they are eloquent and they are irreplaceable voices in our communities. Last but not least, I want to thank the committee and its chairman. Prior to the Interim Public Lands Committee in today's hearing, never before has the Nevada legislature discussed such important facets of our history. I don't know if this would have been possible Mr. without Rowan, your leadership, we're past Mr. Two Chairman, minutes. but I am grateful for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if we can have the next person in support. Caller with the last three digits, one, two, zero. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Ortega, L-I-S-A-O-R-T-E-G-A. -E Chairman Watts, Vice Chair Cohen, and members of the committee, my name is Lisa Ortega, a volunteer member of the Sierra Club's Legislative Committee, 
Southern Nevada Board XCOM member, master arborist, and tree consultant. On behalf of the Sierra Club and our more than 40,000 members and supporters statewide, I'm in speaking in support of AB 171. The testimony we heard today exemplifies that stands of trees with important historical, cultural, spiritual, and ecological significance deserve the type of protections offered by AB 171. The Division of Forestry to the State Forester Fire Warden have and should have the ability to protect forest species of significance. Right now, there are no protections in state law for these unique Spring Valley Swamp Sweet Cedars, Juniperus scopulorum. These pockets of trees are not currently known to exist at the current elevation they stand upon anywhere else and they deserve their own significant place in our nation's flora history and that of the indigenous peoples of Nevada. They are not the typical pinion juniper junior stand who are reduced for fuel and habitat. These, those are juniperus osteosperma. These are juniperus scopulorum. We believe that this legislation offers an opportunity for non-native community to learn more about the customs and traditions of indigenous peoples in the Great Basin. This is a historic opportunity to build trust, gain new understandings of each other in our history in Nevada, while offering protections that preserve places of such historical significance. AB 171 will ensure that important protections outlined in NRS 527.05 apply to the swamp cedars. This effort is about looking outside of existing frameworks I'm and sorry, including new Ortega, perspectives. We're at two minutes. You can thank wrap you. it up. For thank you. Yes, yeah. we want to thank the tribal leaders for your conviction and commitment to sharing history through your stories. Your effort to protect this place is inspiring to a new generation of conservation leaders and marks a new inclusivity future for Nevada. Thank you. And with that, we'll have the uh, next person in support. Call in user one. Please solely state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Hatter, J-O-H-N-H-A-D-D-E-R. Uh, I am the Executive Director of Great Basin Resource Watch uh, in uh, Reno, Nevada. Uh, thank you, uh, committee, and thank you, uh, uh, <coughs> Chairman Howard, for introducing this important bill. Um, we are um, in support of <coughs> 171. Our organization works on extraction issues. We have been out to the Swamp Cedar area. It's uh, unique cultural importance. It's time that um, we begin to recognize and uh, and protect the the, the cultures um, and his and, and history of Nevada um, in in this way. So again, Great Basin Resource Watch and some members is in support of AB 171, and I won't repeat all the wonderful things that people have already said in support. It's uh, been great to hear it all. Thank you very much members of the committee uh, for this opportunity. Thank you. And uh, that will move on to the next person. In Caller, the last three digits, 845. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits, 845. Please press star six to unmute and you may begin. Hi, good good afternoon, Chairman Watson, uh, Vice Chair uh, Cohen. This is Neil Desai, N-E-A-L-D-E-S-A-I. I'm Senior Program Director for the National Parks Conservation Association. Um, we support um, AB 171, uh, ask you to uh, help move it forward, help champion this for all the reasons that uh, speakers before me have said. I'd like to particularly thank uh, Ms. Billsbury and Mr. Steele for your, your comments earlier. Um, you spell out the charge before us and kind of what, 
what we all need to be doing here um, to protect these uh, irreplaceable resources and values. Um, and I just want to uh, maybe echo one point that was raised earlier, uh, perhaps uh, in, in the testimony, but uh, this bill doesn't make the cedars a distinct population. It, it gives it the, the protections um, that are necessary, and, and that's what we want. It gives it the protections of a distinct population. This is a special circumstance for a special place, and it calls for the special considerations that we have available uh, before us. So thank you, Chairman Watts, for advancing this measure um, and for the committee for considering this. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to the um, next person in support. Caller with the last three digits, 130. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. -E -E I'm the policy director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada here in support of Assembly Bill 171. You've just heard testimony from tribal leaders and elders imploring you to take action. We wanna thank those folks for sharing such important stories and providing an opportunity for non-Native people to gain perspective and understanding. We hope that this effort can be an opportunity to build bridges rather than divide. The legislature has an unprecedented opportunity to recognize the cultural and spiritual significance of the swamp cedars and respect the practices that continue to occur there. The Swamp Cedars are a place of prayer, and these prayers are part of a necessary healing process for these communities going through ongoing historic trauma. Although the history of U.S. involvement in the Swamp Cedars is one of horrendous massacres of Indigenous peoples, we have an opportunity to start a new story, one where we invested in protecting and enhancing the land and people within Nevada. We hope that the members of the legislature see the deep importance of protecting the Swamp Cedars as a small but important step toward healing the land and people. Environmental justice requires us to step outside of past frameworks in order to include those who have historically have not been recognized. This legislation does that in a very important way. We urge you to support AB 171. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we'll move on to the next person in support. Caller with the last three digits, 377. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. My name is Jaina Moan, J-A-I-N-A-M-O-A-N, and I'm the External Affairs Director for the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. Chair Watts and members of the committee, we are here to testify in support of AB 171. The Conservancy recognizes the spiritual and cultural importance of the swamp cedars, and we support additional protections for these trees in Spring Valley. With AB 171, we have the chance to protect the traditional knowledge that has been shared with us today. Basawabi is a deeply important cultural landscape. The singular qualities of this place are rooted in a deep relationship that our own human species has developed with this population of trees over countless generations since time immemorial. Recognizing the swamp cedars as protected fauna, as AB 171 will do, will provide a layer of protection for this culturally significant population of trees. Thank you to the tribal leaders for sharing their history and culture. We urge the members of this committee to vote yes on AB 171. Thank you for hearing our testimony. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to the next person in support. Caller with the last three digits, 792. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. This is Pat Donnelly, D-A-T. R I C K O N N E L L I. I'm Nevada State Director with the Center for Biological Diversity. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for bringing this bill. And um, uh, thank, of course, to the tribal elders and spokespersons from earlier who had such compelling testimony. Uh, I won't reiterate their testimony other than to say that my organization's been uh, fighting for the Swamp Leaders for 13 years. They are uh, just as unique ecologically as they are uh, uh, culturally, um, uh, you know, that has been done yet, but uh, it's a unique occurrence to have these trees growing in shallow ground. And so do want to make note of that. Um, one other thing to make note of, um, and that is, as Ms. Spilberry said in her presentation, you know, these protections need teeth. And um, typically when... Uh, 
the Division of Forestry issues a permit. It's done uh, under NAC 2736. And subsection 11 uh, says that the decisions on these permits are full and not subject to judicial review. And while that's a can of worms that we probably don't want to open as far as the entire chapter goes, um, judicial review is what keeps agencies honest and what keeps agencies from to faithfully interpret the law. I might suggest that it not as an amendment because I think it's uh, uh, something for discussion, but I might suggest a, a section in this bill to address the fact and uh, include some amount of review or appealability of the permit issued um, to, to ensure uh, the law is applied um, as intended. Uh, thank you for considering my comments. Thank you. And Mr. Donnelly, you were a bit choppy. I think most of of what you said we got, but um, certainly I invite you to reach out to Chair Watts and to also if you want to provide written testimony just to make sure. Um, so with that, we will move on to the next person in support. Caller with the last three digits, 922. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, for the record, my name is Ainsley Archibald, A-I-N-S-L-E-E-A-R-C-H-I-B-A-L-D, speaking as a coordinator of the Sunrise Movement Las Vegas Hub. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I just want to echo the sentiments of those who spoke before me, especially those of tribal leaders and elders, and add our support to AB 171 for the record. Thank you. Thank you. That will move the person in support. Caller with the last three digits, 672. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits, 672. Please press yes. star six to unmute and you may begin. Hello, my name is Teresa Melendez. Teresa, T-E-R-E-S-A, Melendez, M-E-L-E-N-D-E-Z. And I'm the vice chair for the Nevada Statewide Native American Caucus. And I'm calling in support of AB 171. I'm just gonna make a couple quick statements. But what I thought was really, um, an important point to make today is that we know that we're living on occupied stolen indigenous land. And today we heard passionately from the um, original inhabitants who have always lived on these lands here in Nevada, who still live here. And today they spoke up and they're asking for the help from state representatives to help protect their sacred homelands, their ceremonial lands, their culturally significant sites. So it's moments like these that I think gives us, you know, unique and beautiful opportunities, as a previous caller had mentioned, to, you know, heal our land, heal relationships, um, heal communities, and to also show that we hear and that we see folks who have often been left out of the conversation. So I want to thank um, um, Chairman um, Watts and the Natural Resource Committee for um, taking time and addressing this bill and listening to the indigenous voices of the state. Um, I appreciate your time, miigwech. Thank you, and uh, let's hear from the next person in support. For the callers that have joined recently, we are in support for AB 171. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, I believe we have no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. And with that, we will go to opposition. I, I don't believe there's anyone in opposition on the Zoom. Um, so let's go to the telephones, please. To testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 171, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. 
Thank you. So let's go to neutral. And again, I don't believe there's anyone on the Zoom in neutral. So let's go to the telephones. To testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 171, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits 101, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits 101, you are unmuted and may begin. Uh, Vice Chair, we have no other callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. And I'll um, just, in case there was someone who was trying to call in, uh, feel free to send in your testimony. Uh, we want to make sure that you're able to be heard and certainly will um, distribute that to the members of the committee. Um, with that, Chair, if you'd like to make some closing remarks. Thank you. I think we've got it covered. So in the interest of time, I'll wave my closing. Thank you. And with that, I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 171. And I will now open the hearing on AJR 4, which urges Congress to designate certain land in Spring Valley as a national heritage area. And with that, I will uh, invite Chair Watts back to uh, present this bill. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Again, for the record, Howard Watts, uh, representing Assembly District 15. It is my pleasure to present Assembly Joint Resolution 4 to you as well. Uh, I know uh, we wanna keep a clear record. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll say that Assembly Joint Resolution 4 um, urges uh, the federal government to take action uh, to further protect the Basawabi traditional cultural property, um, also known as the, the Swamp Cedars. And um, while trying to keep these measures separate, um, I'll, I'll indicate that much of what you've already heard today uh, about the, the Swamp Cedars and how important they are uh, and the need for additional protection applies to this measure as it does to the, the other measure which we've already heard. And so my intention is um, not to, to repeat all of that, to try and keep things brief um, so that we don't have to repeat everything for the, for the committee. But um, I would like to uh, very briefly walk you through the proposed amendment uh, to the joint resolution. Um, and I then believe I'll turn it over to Mr. Sanford, who I think has a couple of, of brief remarks he'd like to add, and then I'll take any questions you have specifically about this. So the proposed amendment is essentially a, a rewrite of the resolution, and I won't go through the whereases. They're very similar in terms of content between the amendment and the original draft. However, in consultation with tribal members and elders, we felt that uh, particularly in the description of the massacres and um, the history and traditional practices of these people, that uh, this language was more appropriate to use. So. Uh, the whereases are really rewritten to respect the perspective of the indigenous communities of the area. The, the real change is in the resolution itself. The original uh, resolution called for the designation of a national heritage area. However, Basawabi is already located within the Great Basin National Heritage Area. Uh, so this would not provide any additional uh, federal protection, which was kind of the intent of the Public Lands Committee when we were debating this issue uh, in the interim. So instead, the uh, the revised language urges uh, Congress and the President to take action to further protect the area, including potential designation as a national monument or an expansion of Great Basin National Park. And to be clear, there could be an ext extension of the area of critical uh, environmental concern. Um, there are other uh, options, but and those would ultimately be up to the federal government. The tribes are seeking a national monument. And again, I also want to reiterate that national monuments can be designated by an act of Congress uh, as well. Um, but this is not prescriptive. It is simply asking the federal government as the land managers to strengthen the protections for this particular area. 
Uh, so with that, if Mr. Sanford has uh, any brief remarks he'd like to add, I'd like to let him speak. And then uh, from there, we can go immediately into questions. Please go ahead, Mr. Sanford. Thank you, Chairman Watts and members of the committee. Uh, again, my name is Monty Sanford. Uh, you know, I just have a couple of brief a brief comments on this and that that is really regarding you know the tribe's support for this uh for ajr4 um you know as we said previously there are land management designations on parts of the sacred area but again land management designations do not necessarily protect or provide legal pr protection for the for the area um, they can modify management plans and management decisions, but that's a lot different than having a formal uh, formal legal protection. Uh, I want to reemphasize as well that, you know, here in, uh, in Spring Valley, swamp cedars or Basawabi, I just, I just want to nail home the, uh, the point that there is nothing like this in anywhere else in this uh, in this country or in the state, uh, perhaps in the world. You know, tribal people have been, indigenous people have been in this area uh, since time immemorial. We have archeological evidence dating back to as far as 14,000 years ago uh, of their occup occupancy around swamp cedars, their ceremonial use around swamp cedars. And this long-term, uh, Long term, this time frame of of the tribes being with the cedars and their ceremonial use of the site, I think, is extremely unique and uh, important. And this isn't this isn't some uh, temple in uh, in South America or in or in Latin America. This is this is right here in the state of Nevada. And I, and I sometimes I feel like we can we can sort of forget about that, like the stuff that we have right here at home uh it's right here in front of us and even though it's not a it's not a cathedral or it's not a temple it's the tribe's temple and i think that it's uh it's appropriate for you know this for the committee to support uh something like this uh and and you know we need we need other protection for the site and the acec and the tcp don't provide that sort of protection. So on behalf of the tribes, we would sincerely appreciate the, the committee's uh, supporting of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, just for the record, if anyone is watching um, this hearing in the future, um, I would also recommend or reviewing the, the legislative history, I'd recommend a review of AB 171 uh, due to time constraints. We're not able to have everyone who testified testified, but there was uh, definitely um, some good testimony that you'd want to review um, with some more of the history of uh, what happened in this area and its impact on the tribes. Um, and um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and, and so chair, you're ready for questions. Uh, thank you, vice chair, uh, Howard Watts for the record. Yes, I'm ready to take questions and, uh, would also just note that some of the letters of support express support for both measures. And so, um, some of that, that, uh, testimony from our original presenters can also apply to this bill as well. Thank you. Um, uh, so with that, we have a question from Assemblywoman Titus. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for bringing this bill forward. Question on, and I'm, I have a copy, and thank you for getting getting that out. I have a, the proposed amendment to AJ4 in front of me, and in the description it says, as you clarified, that it is already located within the boundaries of the Great Basin National Heritage Area. So just for clarification, it's already somewhat protected, um, and when you have a Great Basin National Heritage this heritage area it doesn't offer any protection and, and these protections that you're trying to produce. So you want further protection? Thank you for the question. Uh, Howard Watts for the record. 
Uh, that is correct that it's located within the Great Basin National Heritage Area. Uh, this was part of the discussion in the Public Lands Committee. Uh, however, uh, while it is a designation um, and it may potentially afford some protections, uh, it does not uh, provide uh, the level of protection that the, the tribes are seeking. So we're, and since that's the baseline um, and there's concern that there could still be impacts to, to the trees, to the area, uh, we are seeking additional uh, protection from the federal land managers. And again, I will note that um, this is already federally managed land. Thank you. A follow up question on that, uh, Vice Chair, if I might. Looking at the actual um, amendment now for AJR 4, and it's on the back page that we have, and just to, to look at um, the the third paragraph down where it says, whereas, um, and then the swamp cedar trees therein face threat from climate change, development, and other humid triggered activities from non-native communities. Um, so can you describe, uh, obviously the climate change, you might feel that it's warming if they have a beetle infestation or fires, what other activity has been noted to threaten these trees? Thank you very much for the question. Howard Watts, for the record. The most notable example would be the proposal by the Southern Nevada Water Authority to build a groundwater development. Oh, looks like I was cutting out my back. You cut out right after you said uh, groundwater development. All right. So the Southern Nevada Water Authority had proposed a groundwater development pipeline to Eastern Nevada. Uh, Spring Valley was one of the primary uh, areas from which water would have been exported. And as was noted um, previously, uh, these trees thrive in this area because the water table is essentially at ground level, very close by there are sub-irrigated wet meadows um, and, and so on. So that is one example of a proposed development or, or human, <clears throat> excuse me, human triggered activity um, that, that uh, could have severely impacted the area. So based on that, if it's all about the water table, um, this is, would be a designated area with the swamp cedar trees. Would it possibly affect development, not through the swamp area, but around the area that might lower the water table? Thank you for the question. Uh, Howard Watch for the record. As you may be aware, um, that water and uh, effects of drawdowns would be considered in these federal managed, managed lands. If it was a project that had an impact, it would trigger the uh, NEPA process to, uh, and an uh, environmental impact statement. And so anything that um, uh, triggered that process uh, impacts to the trees would already be considered within that. So this particular water basin isn't just within these trees, it's its own unique water basin that also includes the trees and affects potentially a lot of water users within a water basin. Uh, this is uh, some of them Howard Watts to the record. Yes, it is located within Spring Valley. Um, however, this particular, uh, both this particular resolution and the measure we discussed previously do not specifically address water right um, these federal protections would be particularly land management designations uh, that would provide stronger protections for the trees. As far as protecting the water table itself, that is still, uh, is deci those decisions are still within the purview of the state engineer. And um, any of those decisions would, would take into account the drawdowns as they did when uh, the Southern Nevada Water Authority proposed its projects. Great, thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair, for answering those questions. I always worry about the unintended consequences of really well-meaning uh, things that we bring forward and just wanted some clarification. So thank you for that. Thank you. Committee, do we have any other questions? Okay, uh, Chair, would you like to go on to support? Yes, please. Okay, with that, um, we will move on to support, please. I don't think. 
Vice Chair, this is broadcast. You're muted. I'm sorry, um, Miss uh, Miss Billsbury. I did cut you off when you were um, trying to talk about AJR for um, in the last hearing. Do, do you want to make a brief uh, statement in support before we go on to the telephone support? Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. I just, I just, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Just clicked it again. Can you hear us now? We can hear you. I was just uh, in in support of that. Oh, that was a, that was a, it was going to be just short. I do support it. Thank you very much. Um, and and with that, then we'll move on to the telephones. To testify in support of AJR four, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 377. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, my name is Jaina Moan, J-A-I-N-A-M-O-A-N, and I'm the External Affairs Director for the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. Chair Watts and members of the committee, we are here to testify in support of AJR4. We recognize the importance of the Bashawabi for the native peoples of Nevada and support additional protections for this culturally significant place. The Conservancy would like to share an additional reason for why it's important to conserve Spring Valley. As indicated in our written testimony, the Nature Conservancy has recently mapped landscapes in North America that can provide habitat for species as they migrate or shift locations in response to climate change. Using this data, the Conservancy identified several climate resilient corridors in Nevada, which are networks of connected lands and waters where nature can thrive in spite of changing conditions. One of those networks, which we call the Monsoon Corridor, named for its location at the western edge of the Baja Monsoonal Storms, extends along the valleys and ranges in eastern Nevada. Spring Valley is a key node of the Monsoon Corridor. We think it will provide refuge for plants and wildlife from drought and heat. It is a unique ecosystem and microhabitat, and there is no similar place anywhere else. There are many reasons to protect Spring Valley. We urge the members of this committee to vote yes on AJR4. Thank you so much for hearing my testimony. Thank you, and next person in support. Caller with the last three digits, 845. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Watson, Vice Chair Cohen, and members of the committee. This is Neil Desai, N-E-A-L-D-E-S-A-I, Senior Program Director with the National Parks Conservation Association. Uh, we also uh, strongly support AJR4 uh, and ask the members of this committee to uh, move this forward, <clears throat> forward for all the reasons mentioned before. Um, and that concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next person in support, please. Caller with the last three digits, 155. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy Cabrera, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-C-A-B-R-E-R-A. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director for the Nevada Conservation League in support of AJR4. We must preserve places with such historic and cultural importance. AJR4 is a step in the right direction to ensuring permanent protection of swamp cedars and the special place where they grow. We urge the committee support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person in support, please. Caller with the last three digits, 130. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. -E -E and I'm the Policy Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada here in support of AJR4. 
This legislation recognizes that sacred places for indigenous peoples exist outside of the arbitrarily set up reservation boundaries. In this case, they exist on stolen land that has been declared part of the federal government. For many years, Nevada tribes who value this area as culturally and traditionally significant have worked to preserve the swamp feeders for future generations. It is imperative for us to do all we can for a place that holds such significance for the rightful caretakers of these areas. AJR4 is an important step to ensure that we are doing all we can. We urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Next person in support, please. Caller with the last three digits, 445. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Um, good afternoon, Vice Chair Cohen and members of the committee. And thank you so much, Chair Watts and the tribal elders for sharing your stories. I am Teresa Crawford, T-E-R-E-S-A-C-R-A-W, F-O-R-D, volunteer with the Sierra Club Toyabi Chapter. On behalf of the club and our more than 40,000 members and supporters statewide, I am honored to speak in support of AJR4 um, as, as amended. Uh, what we recognize is the area needs much higher federal protection uh, than it has, whether we encourage our congressional delegation, U.S. Congress, and the Biden administration to offer a national monument listing or an expansion of Great Basin National Park or a co-managed system between the tribes and federal officials. Um, it can't be denied that within this area are cultural, historical, spiritual, and natural resources that must be treasured and preserved. Um, the swamp cedars themselves depend on a shallow water table, and uh, pumping it could cause um, their extinction. This res resolution, for the um, most importantly, elevates and recognizes a sacred place for the Ely Shoshone, Duckwater Shoshone, and Confederated Tribes of the Goshute Reservation. And as uh, Mr. Sanford says, uh, nothing like this has ever been done in Nevada or even the nation. And as uh, Ms. Saunders says, uh, sacred places exist outside the boundaries of reservations. Um, the Sierra Club is committed to fighting for and recognizing the importance of protecting the spiritual and cultural practices of Native communities. We believe this request to the Nevada Congressional Delegation is a critical step to ensure lasting protection and peace for the Sacred Water Valley. Thank you. Your next person in support, please. Caller with the last three digits, 594. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and we begin. My name is Shania Marks, S-H-A-N-I-A-M-A-R-Q-U-E-S, and I am the culture representative for the Yui Shoshone tribe, and I support this bill. Thank you. Next person in support, please. Caller with the last three digits, 101. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Watts, Vice Chair Cohen, members of the committee. My name is Dominique Echegoyen, spelled D-O-M-I-N-I-Q-U-E-E-T-C-H-E-G. O-Y-H-E-N, and I serve as a deputy director for the Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, which is in support of Assembly Joint Resolution 4. The Department of Conservation and Natural Resources recognizes the historic, sacred, and cultural significance of the swamp cedars. And given that the swamp cedars are on federal land, the department supports a federal solution, as has been proposed in AJR 4. Um, I did want to point out that I attempted to speak on the last bill, but I didn't realize that the number that went out of my office was a separate number than my office line. So I will submit written testimony in neutral on AB 171. There were some questions um, regarding how the Division of Forestry would notify um, people of the protection and um, protect the species if um, that bill were passed. And I wanted to ensure um, the public and the members of the committee that the Division of Forestry would work in consultation with the tribes uh, to determine what would be the effective, what would be effective and most culturally appropriate. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, and we'll look forward to receiving that written testimony. 
Uh, next person in support, please. Caller with the last three digits, 662. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll we'll have two minutes and may begin. My name is Kyle Rorink, K-Y-L-E-R-O-E-R-I-N-K. I'm the executive director of the Great Basin Water Network. Chairman Watts and members of the committee, the Great Basin Water Network asks uh, you to support AJR4. I'd like the record to reflect my comments on AB 171, and I just wanted to add a few more things. Um, you know, an area of, of critical environmental concern and a traditional cultural property are certainly not strong enough uh, federal designations for such an important place, nor is a, a heritage area designation. And, you know, that's what warrants the need uh, for this bill. Uh, special circumstances like what's being proposed are, are warranted uh, for such outstanding considerations. And I just wanted to leave you all with, with one thing. When Chairman Steele and Delane Spillsbury and others go to the Swamp Cedars, they're going there to, to visit their family. And I ask that, that you think about that um, when, when you're thinking about this bill. This, this legislation is about many things, but principal among them is a connection to family. And both pieces of legislation in tonight's hearing recognize a connection to an ancestry. And that's one of the most sacred bonds we have with other humans um, in this world and our past and the relation of kinship, it's, it's inimitable. And for the descendants of the Nua, the, the original inhabitants in Nevada, Basawabi and, and the Swamp Cedars, that's where they go to reflect, heal, pray, learn, mourn, and remember their kin. And it's a lens by which indigenous peoples, you know, see the world past and present. And, um, you know, this, this bill literally means, means the world to, to my friends, Elaine Spillsbury and, and Chairman Steele, and I just ask that, that you support this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next person in support, please. Caller with the last three digits, 792. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. This is Patrick Donnelly. P-A-T-R-I-C-A-D-O-N-N-E-L-L-Y. -L -L I'm Nevada Director with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, we support AJR4, the existing uh, designations at the site um, of the Swamp Cedars are equipped to protect the species. And as evidence of that, uh, BLM actually leaked part of the TCP or put a parcel in the TCP up the spill drill uh, a couple of years ago. Now it did end up getting released at the auction, but none of it was made available for oil drilling. Mr. Donnelly, um, you're and, really breaking up. Do you want to? Uh, you're breaking I'm, up. Do you want to just um, submit written testimony? Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next person in support. Call in user one. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. This is John Hatter, J-O-H-N-H-A-D-D-E-R. I'm the executive director of Great Basin Resource Watch. Uh, we are in support, in support of this resolution uh, for all the reasons that have been discussed already. Um, again, it is uh, time we, uh, we protect uh, and, and work with the, uh, uh, the, the, the people that we have inherited this land uh, from that have uh, been here for many generations. They appreciate all their hard work in, in, uh, in protecting their culture, and it's time that um, the state of Nevada and the people uh, uh, help them protect the culture um, that's so important um, to their livelihood and their way of life. Um, critical to all of us that live here. I think there's been wonderful statements made. Again, Great Basin Resource Watch, Great Basin Resource Watch for the record uh, supports uh, this resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll move on to the next person in support, please. 
caller with the last three digits, 728. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. For the record, this is Marla McDade Williams with Strategies 360, speaking again on behalf of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. And for all the reasons outlined in my previous testimony, we want to go on record in support of AJR4. Thank you. Thank you. And um, next person in support, please. For those callers that have joined recently, we are on support for AJR4. Please press star nine now to enter the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 922. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, for the record, my name is Ainsley Archibald, A-I-N-S-L-E-E-A-R-C-H-I-B-A-L-D, speaking as a coordinator of the Sunrise Movement Las Vegas Hub. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. We were happy to sign on to the coalition letter supporting AJR4 and AB171, and again, would like to add our support to AJR4 for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person in support. Caller with the last three digits, 557. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. I am Rick Spilsbury, R-I-C-K-S-P-I-L-S-B-U-R-Y. I'm a tribal elder with the Eva Shoshone tribe, and I'm here to ask you to support this resolution. In spite of how vitally important Spring Valley was to my ancestors' survival, natives don't live in Spring Valley anymore. My people suffered from what is now called ethnic cleansing. This is a memory worth respecting. When our people died in these three massacres, what was once them became food for these trees. Literally, what was once our ancestors is now in those trees. We can't save the people who were mass murdered, which is why we have to save their memory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person in support, please. Vice Chair, we have no more callers in support at this time. Okay, uh, then we will go to opposition. Uh, I don't believe we have anyone in opposition on the Zoom, so let's go to the phones. To testify in opposition on AJR4, please press star nine now to enter the queue. Vice Chair, it seems we have no callers in opposition at this time. Okay, uh, anyone in neutral? I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom in neutral, so if we could go to the phones, please. To testify in neutral on Assembly Bill, or AJR4, please press star nine now to enter the queue. Vice Chair, I do not believe we have anyone in neutral at this time. All right, uh, with that, uh, Chair, would you like to make any closing remarks or have any of your, um, or um, have your fellow presenter make a closing remark? Thank you, Vice Chair. Howard Watts for the record. Huh? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, How, uh, Vice Chair. Howard Watts for the record. No, I believe the, Testimony and support, uh, as well as the written testimony, is sufficient. So I'll waive any additional closing. Okay, thank you. And with that, I will bring uh, the hearing on Assembly Joint Resolution 4 to a close and um, have the chair uh, take over the committee again. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair. I appreciate you uh, helping move the committee through those hearings. With that, that brings us to the last item on our agenda today, uh, which is public comment. Uh, again, in order to provide public comment, you must register in advance. You'll get the call-in information, and we ask that callers limit their comments to two minutes. With that, we'll turn it over to Broadcast Production Services one more time to see if we have any callers in the queue for public comment. To take your place in the public comment queue, please press star nine now.
caller with the last three digits 490. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Cyrus Hojati, C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. We always like to talk about environmental protection, and I think it's very, very important. But to truly have pure environmental protection is we need to address the elephant in the room, and that is our global economic system, the monetary system, whether it is capitalism, socialism, communism, and fascism. They're all garbage systems. We have environmental problems solely because of self-interest people, primarily corporations that want to profit heavily while at the expense of others. And we're not going to have environmental protections in the state of Nevada truly if we're going to have a high level of inequality that buys and bribes both parties in order to benefit the few over the many. So in order to have true environmental protection, we need to get rid of the monetary system and completely abolish it. And we need to implement a resource-based economy. I suggest you Google it. It is part of the Zeitgeist Movement, the Venus Project. We need to move on. Our economic system is becoming more dysfunctional as technology is increasingly taking away many, many jobs. The need of labor for income is diminishing, and we're moving toward an access-sharing economy, moving away from ownership. You're seeing this with the Lime scooters, the Uberization, and so forth. So it is time to have an overhaul of the global economic system, and this is going to solve many problems around the world. So do what you can. Please open your minds up and understand who is really running the money and explains the root cause of our problem. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next caller, which will provide public comments. Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no more callers at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcast Production Services, for your assistance in uh, ensuring that every, uh, folks were able to provide comment and testimony during this uh, meeting. Thank you to the members for your questions and attention uh, for, for uh, this two hour long meeting. I appreciate it. Um, and to members of the public for your participation. Uh, we always uh, like to hear your perspectives and are glad that you got engaged during this meeting. Uh, with that, uh, our next meeting will be on Wednesday, March 17th at 4 p.m. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye.